Okay. Uh, I like those three. I think that's sufficient. There's not a uh, fourth one when you write them down that way. You're upside down. You don't have sufficient other assets, and the bank opts to take less than they are owned and release the liens. That was the fourth one I said as if it were the third one. Okay. They opt to take less than their own and release the liens. Now, you can convey it without the encumbrance of the previous debt. Does all that make sense to you? Okay. Now, let's talk about why this ended up. This sounds like a lender issue. Sounds like a lender issue. Why does it end up in a real estate, you know, 101 class, so to speak? At the advent of the short sale phenomenon, agents can constantly screwed up. And here's why. First of all, most agents are good people. I'm looking around, I think y'all are good people. You, you might find yourself in this type of situation. Do you understand someone that's in a process of a short sale? Can you imagine how stressful it is to them? And as a, another human and a professional, you're like, gosh, I'd really like to help them out of this. So oftentimes, you go and you talk to these people, they'd be so distraught. And uh, agents would say something like this, oh, well, let me get on the phone with your lender. Maybe I can work something out. And wrong answer. The minute that you get on the phone with their lender and start trying to negotiate the terms of that agreement, you have just participated in the practice of what? Law. Law. You are now trying to negotiate a third-party contract. The contract for that, for that loan is between the bank and that seller. If you get involved in the negotiations, you're practicing law. Do you have a law license? <coughs> you get it in this class. Amanda's the only one that has one from Park. So she can do that, man. So agents were doing that, all right? Agents also would start answering questions that they did not know the answer to. They felt like they had to have these answers, but they should not have. Just because you don't know an answer doesn't mean you should make one up. You should say, I'll tell you what, let me go find you someone who can answer that question. Here come some of the questions. Well, Chris, if I take a short sale, will it hurt my credit as bad as if I had a foreclosure? What's your answer? What do you think? Will a short sale hurt your credit as bad as a foreclosure? Uh, <laughs> What'd you say? Somebody actually said it, I think. Seek legal advice. <laughs> yeah, maybe legal advice, but certainly talk to someone other than me. And here's why. I don't report you to the credit bureau. I have no control over how that's reported to the credit bureau. It sounds logical that a short sale should not hurt your credit as much as a foreclosure. It sounds logical, but it's not necessarily true. Think about this for just a second. If that bank were to foreclose on me today, it's going to be painful, right? But in a couple of years, I could buy a house. I clean my credit up. I get everything going. I talk to a bank. They understand my position. My income, you know, maybe the reason I couldn't pay is because I lost my job in the, during the crash of 2008. I got my ducks in a row now. I go two or three years, I could probably buy another house. Think about a short sale. If your short sale lingers for 14, 16 months and you're not paying the bank, let me tell you something, this is not looking any better on your credit score than a uh, foreclosure uh, would. I honestly don't know. It depends on how the bank chooses to report it to the credit bureau. Yeah. You are doing what with the letter, start with the letter D? Oh. You're defaulting on the terms of your mortgage note. That's all the question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In the short sale as in the yeah. in, a, in a short sale, you know, you just need to sell your property and you're upside down, so you're looking for a strategy. Yeah, you're looking for a strategy. So where's the commission the realtor come from? Or is there? <laughs> we had to get to the important part quick, right? <laughs> Hold that thought for just a little bit, but it's not a bad question. A lot of agents end up getting screwed early on also by this. Yeah. So this is like I don't know, a random question, but have you seen the big short? Have I seen the, the movie The Big Short? Yeah, it's a good movie. Like, That's exactly what uh, this is about. Well, what it's about, it, it goes back to the whole financial crisis and how uh, it came into existence. It's actually a really, really good uh, movie. Now granted it's not it's it's not a uh, it's not a documentary. But a lot of it is, in fact, based on what was going on during this time. And I think the people in the movie are actually based on, on real people. So, yes, good movie. Can't remember the language. I always tell people when I uh, when I uh, recommend movies in this class, be careful because I, I normally don't watch them around my kids, so I don't worry about what the language uh, is. 
And so then when I recommend somebody, I always come back and say, I can't believe you told me to watch that movie. I started it up with my kid the other night. I had to cut it off three minutes into it. I apologize for that, but some movies I watch do have a rough language uh, in them. Watch it without the kids. Short sale and short follow. Short sale what? Short fall. Short fall? Uh, well, the, the word short fall just means you're short. Okay, you, you just short. Short sale means something specific. That's the word I want you to focus on. Okay. Now remember, I was talking to you where agents were going wrong, right? Don't tell people how this is going to affect their credit score. You're not involved in that end of the business. Then listen to this other question that agents were attempting to answer and how they would kind of go off course with this. Um, so let me get this straight. If I take a short sale, then the lender will not come after me for a deficiency judgment. True or false? And it does kind of depend. But for the most part, that was not true. Yeah, the fact of the matter is, one of the, does anybody do business with the uh, credit union, State Employees Credit Union? You do? Okay. Uh, of all the State Employees Credit Union is pretty easy to work with. They're good people. They have a, you know, they're, they're really very supportive of their members. But they will not give up on deficiency judgments. They never give up on deficiency judgments. And the reason is, is because technically it's their members' money. And so they always have to protect, protect their members' money. So the agents were out there saying, no, oh, yeah, if, if they take the uh, short sale, they can't go after you for deficiency judgment. Wrong <clears throat> answer. It's completely not true. Interestingly enough, over time, some programs developed that would allow for the uh, lender to basically uh, do a short sale and not come after you for deficiency judgments. This is part of, you still hear some of it on the radio today. Have you ever heard advertisements for HARP or AMP or the Affordable Home Loan, uh, uh, what's the uh, act or whatever it's going to call it. But anyway, a lot of this grew out of this short sale phenomenon, the HAMP and HARP and all those uh, type things. Well, the fact of the matter is there are some programs today where they literally will say this, if you agree, if the bank agrees to a short sale, they will not come after you for your deficiency judgments. Okay, so that's not untrue for certain programs, but it doesn't need to be you as an agent describing that. That needs to be someone from the program describing that so that they know all the details. And here's what was bad about one of those programs. One of those programs that allowed, the, uh, allowed you to write off your deficiency uh, judgments basically said this. Let's talk about the IRS. I don't know how much you know about the IRS. But if for some reason you were able to waive your deficiency uh, judgments, the bank was able to write off a loss. They were able to write off a taxable loss. You were upside down by $40,000. The bank, in theory, lost $40,000, right? And the bank wrote that off as a loss against their income, right, to the IRS? Here's the way the IRS works. If somebody else had a loss, somebody else had to have a what? Gain. So you thought your short sale days were over until in January you got a 1099 that said you made $40,000 last year. And you're thinking, I don't know nothing to make $40,000, but now you're getting taxed on that $40,000. Okay? So agents, they didn't mean to mislead people. These are just things that happen. There was actually a program as well that said, not only can you waive your deficiency judgments, but as part of this program, the IRS will forgive these shortages that came up during this period of time. So there was a program for that as well. But here's something a lot of people didn't realize about that. Under this program, the IRS would forgive these uh, deficiencies. They would forgive this, this uh, fake money, so to speak, this fake income, but only if it was part of the acquisition debt of you buying the house. So in other words, it's debt that you created by buying the house or doing an improvement to the house. A lot of these people that were upside down, let me take you back to the early part of the 2000s. Have you all ever heard of Ditech.com? Ditech.com. They would loan you 125% of your home value. Now, people would see that as I'm borrowing against my home. I'd be borrowing the same amount of money against my home. What do you think they were buying with that money? Cars, boats, airplanes. You know, the stuff like a little airplane. Okay, not Cessna, not, not, uh, not G5 or anything like that, G6, whatever they call it. But they're buying stuff, all right? That's not mortgage debt, right? That's something that they created because they wanted our toys. I can tell you, the IRS is never going to forgive that. What's my point? I don't need you writing any of that stuff down. Here's what my uh, point is. Agents were giving bad advice. 
Why were agents given bad advice? Because they didn't know. And in an effort to help, rather than go out and put the buyers, uh, the borrowers, with a, uh, someone who did know, they started trying to answer questions that they did not have the education to. Matter of fact, I actually sat in a class one day, and I heard someone talking who did know. And here's what she said. She worked for a uh, mortgage company, and we were talking about short sales, and she made this comment to a class. The class was packed. There was probably 60 or so real estate agents in this class, and she makes this comment. She says, well, it, in all honesty, a lender will not even consider a borrower for a short sale until they've missed at least three payments. Okay. So I'm listening to this, and she's telling this to a bunch of real estate agents. And you know what I was thinking in my mind? Did she just tell these agents to go out and advise their clients to skip three payments? You want a short sale? You're upside down? As long as you're making your payment every month, you're never going to get it. Right? Why would a bank? relieve you of your debt if you're able to pay that debt. Did she just tell you to go out and advise your client to skip three payments? Because now you are going to deal with mortgage fraud. That's what I was wondering between foreclosure and short sales. Like yeah. why even, I guess, sell the house then? Well, what happened was because there were so many people that ended up in this uh, situation, do you realize in places like California and Nevada that at one point after 2008, Almost 70% of the houses that were being sold were underwater. And I'm not talking about a little bit underwater, I'm talking about way underwater. When their markets crashed, they crashed hard. And so all these people are holding way more debt than what they owe. And so the banks couldn't foreclose on everybody. They were trying to find the most efficient way to work themselves with this uh, problem. Do you have a definition of short sale? Okay, that was important. Uh, let me put this on the table and tell you this is important. A short sale is always a material fact. You know, again, things that are important for an agent to know. If you know your seller is involved in a short sale, it's always a material fact. Can you tell me why? Okay. Oh, raise your hand. You have to now because you raise your hand. Why is it a material fact that the buyer would need to know? Well, because it might take a long time to close. Bingo. And it's also going to be dependent upon whose approval. Now listen, in a short sale, the contract is still between the buyer and the seller. But that lender has a big trump card out there, don't they? The lender doesn't have to take less than what they're owed. They may choose not to. Okay? So not only might it take a long period of time, the lender may never approve the short sale. So Brad, how much money are you going to spend buyer until you know that you have lien holder approval? In other words, how much money are you going to spend on doing your diligence until you have lien holder approval? No. I'm not spending any until I know that the lender is going to approve it. I'm sorry, what was your original question going to be? I was just going to ask why there's a North Carolina flag next to the material fact. Oh, because when we talk about material uh, facts, uh, we talk about it from the standpoint of our commission. Our commission says okay. that a short sale is always a material fact. I expect it's probably similar in other states, but when we talk about materiality, we're talking about what our commission says is material. Okay? I, as long as we're on that note, let me ask you this. How about foreclosures? Are foreclosures a material fact? The fact that your seller is involved in a foreclosure, is that a material fact? Yes. The answer is yes, but I want you to be very specific about this. I want you to be very specific about this. The fact that your seller is behind three payments to the bank, is that a material fact? No. Not yet. Until you know that it's a short sale, or until the bank comes out and posts a notice of foreclosure sale. If they come out and post a notice of foreclosure sale, now it's material because now there's a timeline involved that buyers would need to be aware of. Okay? Definition of a short sale, materiality of short sale, and uh, foreclosure. Yes? So as an agent, how will you know if a seller is in a short sale? Because you said the agent doesn't call the lender. Does the seller literally call the lender and say, can I get involved in a short sale? I have to make payments for three months? Yeah, the, the seller should start this process. And today, they're actually attorneys. Oh. That, uh, that are involved in this. Let me go back to a question that I can't answer. The way you started that off, whether you meant to or not, you said, how would an agent know? How would you know that the seller that you're sitting down with is in a position that they're likely going to be upside down? Okay. As an agent, aren't you going to help them find their market value? Technically, we, we refer to that as probable sell price. We don't call it market value as agents. But anyway, I know roughly what the house is going to sell for, right? Do you remember in the listing agreement where you ask them how much they owe? 
And you remember me saying something like, I don't really trust them. What I'd really like to see is their last statement. So put together what we talked about, Todd, today. Aren't their deeds of trust going to be recorded? Okay. So if there's money borrowed against that house, I can go to the Register of Deeds. You can actually do this at your desk in Wayne County because it's all public information. So I can look and see, all right, you have three deeds of trust against your property or you have a deed of trust in an equity line, whatever. I can see that there are three things recorded against the title of this property. And then I'm going to ask the seller, can you tell me how much you owe? Well, on my first mortgage, I owe 173 and on my second, I owe 28 Okay, that's great. How about the third? What do you mean the third? Dude, it's public record. I can look and see that you have a third lien. Could you just give me the bank statements for one, two, and three? And that way I can do a net to seller. And on that net to seller, I look at it. Is he going to net enough to pay this off over here? And if not, it's a short sale. And if it's really, really close, I would go ahead and start preparing. What are your options if this doesn't come through? And Andrea says, one of the options I want to make sure of is make sure of is at the end of the day they have enough money to pay me right I mean think about it if they're gonna make exactly what they owe my question is how you how are you gonna get paid okay so start that process early and determine whether it's worth you working with this person or not okay you don't have to work with everybody and some people are not worth working with and I don't mean that in an ugly way it's just that it might be impossible for you to be able to complete a transaction on that. In the early going, Andrea, a lot of agents would get to the table and they would, uh, the banks kind of looking around at these short sales and they're saying, okay, we're losing money. Who else here at the table is losing money? Well, the seller clearly is losing uh, money because they don't have any. And everybody would turn and look at the agent and say, you're making $12,000. Nobody else here is making any money. How about if we cut that down to six? Well, no, you're not going to cut my commission. Bank says, we're out. We're walking. What are you going to do? Most agents will put in a position that they ended up cutting their commission at the closing table. Some of the programs today will literally protect you. If it's in this program, it recognizes that the best way to get the best price on that house is with an agent marketing the uh, house. Okay. Yellow. Slightly off subject, how many real companies do they get paid before the agents do? Um, I don't lose so much before. They would not be prioritized. Okay. They, they're paid differently in most uh, cases, the real companies are. Yeah, okay. most of the time when you say a reload company, you're talking about somebody working for IBM, taking yeah. care of their uh, reloads. Because like a lot of agents, um, a lot of my clients have told me that they won't even do reload for properties. It's because reloads take a huge referral fee. Okay, there's one company out there that takes a 46% referral uh, fee. You think about that, you made $12,000, you split it with somebody else, now you made $6,000, now you have to pay 46% to this uh, company before you take your split. So at the end of the day, the referral company ends up making more money than the agents. But uh, they would, I mean, they would get that money prior. No, 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 it's, it it's comes just, out of your commission. Okay. It comes out of your commission, yeah. But if you agree to take the referral, okay. you agree that if I take okay. the referral, that you will pay them that referral fee. That's why some people won't take okay. it. I don't blame them for doing it. On the other hand, the referral business is almost guaranteed business. Right. You know that person's going to buy or sell. So. Right. Okay, uh, and then finally, the last important part about the short sale is something that now should be obvious. Once I say it, it will be obvious to you. Well, what role do agents play in this uh, short sale? As a listing agent, what are you going to do for your client in regards to the short sale? Are you going to market the property to try to get exposure to as many buyers as possible? Yeah. Are you going to help the seller when the buyers make offer to understand how to read the contracts and negotiate? Yeah. If this sounds familiar to you, agents do the same thing in a short sale that they do in every sale. They try to expose the property to as many potential buyers as possible. Today, there are likely going to be uh, attorneys, lenders, and maybe even accountants involved in advising the buyers. Uh, I'm sorry, the sellers on this, okay? Don't play some part that you are not qualified to play in a short sale. Would you list that in the MLS, that it's a short sale? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Remember, it's a material fact. Right. Okay. And when we it. put it in MLS, there's actually a category for short sales. Okay. So was, we're not trying to keep it secret at all. Okay. It is what it is. And don't, don't assume the buyer just because it's a short sale, you're getting a great deal. Right. Yeah, a lot of these things, they're, they're short sales, but to be honest with you, when the market recenter, 
uh, what you're paying for at short sale might be the retail price. You have to determine whether it's worth it and all that. How about repair negotiations under short sale? What do you think they're going to look like? What do you think repair negotiations under a short sale are going to look like? Can the buyer ask for anything to be repaired? No. You can. Are you going to get it? No. No. If they don't have money to pay their bills, they're likely not going to pay to do the um, uh, repairs. Okay, so there's some things that become kind of obvious as you get deeply into these. Our area, we don't have a ton of in the yellow. We've cleaned up our house pretty good. Do buyer agents avoid short sales? Um, you would not without the buyer's permission, but certainly if I'm talking to my buyer, I would say there's three houses out there we can look at, and unless the short sale is a substantial deal, be aware. Timing, uh, we have to have lien lower approval, etc., etc. Um, there, there are times that I would have advised the buyer to, uh, you know, maybe look at it. You got to close in 30 days. Don't look at the short sale. Today it is much better because the programs make it so. But still, having said that, there's I tell you, there's a lot less to have to deal with if you buy something that's not a short sale. Yeah, when I when I bought my first house. I didn't even know what a short sale was. I mean, yeah. just like, we're not even going to look at them. Okay. They shouldn't make that decision for you, but having said that, I think given the information, you probably would have said the same thing. Right. Yeah. So, if you're deciding to do a short sale, you don't already have the permission to do the what, what happens today is the minute that sellers know that they're going to be in a short sale, most of the time, agents are going to recommend that they get in touch with a short sale counselor and go ahead and have everything set up. That way when Brad comes to buy the house, he's looking at maybe 30 to 45 days instead of six or nine months. If you wait till after you get an offer to realize it's a short sale, now it could take months before you get all the paperwork done. Okay, that's the logic that we're seeing today. Let's go ahead and build it up front and get it, make it marketable. Uh, see if this makes sense to you. In this class, as we talked about, well, we just got through we talking about like contracts and agency and stuff like that. Do you recognize that it's important when you're making an offer on a property that's a short sale, there is a short sale addendum. There is a short sale addendum. I am making an offer to you, and there is a short sale addendum attached to the uh, contract. I would love it. I would love it if you could lodge it as to what is in that uh, short sale contract. I'll give you a little bit of guidance, but let's see if you can figure it out. What are the protections for the buyer? A buyer is making an offer on a property that is a short sale. The buyer doesn't even know he's going to get that house. Give me a couple of protections you think the buyer should have when they're making an offer on a short sale. Who wants to do it? Go, Jen. Okay. I don't know which way I want to go with that because you you're kind of right in the middle of the two biggies that I wanted to talk about. In the short sale addendum, would it surprise you to know that putting up due diligence and earnest money is actually predicated on lien holder approval? You don't even have to put the money up until we have lien holder approval. Okay? And then the other way that you kind of split that difference was what right, and remember the buyer doesn't know if he's going to get this house or not until the lien holder has approved. So what right do you think the buyer has during the term of the short sale period? Then they can literally walk away during that period of time. And that's why I suggested to you just a moment ago, I'm not putting up a whole lot of money on this house until I have lien holder approval. And up until that time, the buyer can freely walk away. Okay? Does that make sense that those would be the two biggies in the short sale agenda for the buyer? The one for the seller is a little more difficult. Go ahead, John. Well, you would still, for our purposes, let's assume it's going to be like any other transaction, even though it's not in the field. Get trained on this in the field. But as far as agents are concerned, it's really a buyer negotiating with a seller. It's just that the seller has this major contingency, and he doesn't know whether he's going to get lien card approval. In the field, get training on this and find out who your short sale consultants are. Probably a law firm that would be able to help walk you through this. Okay. What protection do you think the seller has? And, and listen, this is a little more difficult to spot. The protection of the seller in the short sale addendum. Okay. Think about this for just a moment. 
Do you remember provision A of the offer to purchase in contract? Anybody remember provision A? You're not going to get it. You're not going to. Go ahead. What was it? <laughs> Good try. It's actually seller obligations. Seller obligations. And you remember when I talked about provision A in the contract, I talked about the fact that if the seller can't fulfill their obligations, they are in what word start with the letter B? Breach. They're in breach, right? So think about this. If you're in a short sale seller, if you're in a short sale contract, you don't know whether you can deliver title or not. Remember in provision A that said, I'm going to deliver fee simple marketable title under a general warranty deed. I don't even know if I can do that without leaving over approval. So basically, what the short sale addendum says that protects the seller is, hey, buyer, look, I told you that this is a short sale. So if I never get lien holder approval, don't try to sue me for tying you up. And if you spend any money, you need to be advised. I'm not giving you that money back. And if you want to negotiate on repairs, be advised. I don't have much money. It doesn't say these things literally, but that's the thing of it. You understand, this is a short sale. Buyer, with that information, you do what you think is appropriate. Don't hold me in breach if I can't later deliver title. Does that make sense? The short sale uh, addendum. Okay. With that, I think we are finished with the short sale addendum. Last chance for simple questions on short sale. Once they get lien holder approval, then do all the other things stay in effect? Like you have to put up money? Yeah. Yeah, after that, the buyer's bound. After a lien holder uh, approval, then at that point, if they haven't backed away, they're expected to close. Okay? Put money up, close. Y'all feel okay about the short sale? Definition, agent's role, materiality. Sound good? Let's move on. I've already told you this, so if you don't mind, I'm going to go through it just very quickly. We talked about a promissory note, a promise to repay a debt. I want you to look at this list. If I were me, I would say, memorize this list. I don't think you have to. Promissory note, your promise to repay a debt, see if it makes sense that you should have the terms. Don't you think in a promissory note that the terms should be spelled out? Here, yeah, I have some advice for you. If you owe someone money, don't sign a note that, do, that doesn't have the terms spelled out. Otherwise, you'll be paying on it forever. Okay? I'm paying you this amount at this interest and the payments are going to be done then. The terms are clearly going to be there. There has to be a promise to repay a debt. I promise you to pay this debt at those terms. And then who's going to sign it? The buyer, in this case, will be the trustor in the deed of my trust. So it's consistent with what we've talked about in the uh, past. It must be in writing because it's a contract and it doesn't need to be reported because it has nothing to do with conveyance of property. It has everything to do with you owing money. You okay on that? All right, it's about to get important. It's about to get important. So you're back to taking notes here. There are three things on this slide. I want to tell you five. And the five things I'm getting ready to do with you have to do with special provisions in a promissory note or deed of trust. Special or common provisions in a promissory note or deed of trust. These make great test questions. They are in your promissory note and deed of uh, trust. You just need to be able to understand the level one definition and how it applies. Let me give you an example. Let's first start off with the word acceleration. In most deeds of trust, there will be an acceleration clause. I want you to associate the word acceler acceleration with breach or default. Acceleration, please associate it with breach or default. Here's what the acceleration clause says. Now keep in mind we're talking about a promissory note and deed of trust, right? If the borrower breaches or defaults, if the borrower breaches or defaults, the lender has the right to call the whole note due. In the event of a breach or default, the lender has the right to call the whole note due. Whole, W-H-O-L-E, note, N-O-T-E, the whole note due. Basically what it's saying is, you stop making your payments, the bank has a right to say, well, instead of giving you 30 years to pay this off, we now want to be paid off today. I want you to think about that for just a second. So here's the deal. The borrower has not made his last three or four payments. 
if the bank calls the note due, what are the chances he's going to be able to pay it off? Yeah, to be quite honest with you, by the time the bank activates the acceleration clause, they're getting really, really close to foreclosing at this point. All right? The acceleration clause. Do you understand the word accelerate? Okay? You missed three payments. You were going to have 30 years to pay us off. Now we're going to speed it up. you got to pay us off now. But it's your fault. You default. Make sense? Acceleration. Default. Questions or comments on that? Good. Next one. Prepayment penalty clause. Now, I don't think you need to stay up late at night. Learn what a prepayment penalty clause is. Sounds to me like it's a clause that says if you prepay, there's going to be a what? Penalty. Okay, that's exactly what it says. Now, you might have a tougher time understanding why there would be a prepayment penalty clause. Sometimes when I teach this class, I teach the lecture first, and then I do the math. Sometimes I do the math first, and I uh, teach the uh, lecture. Let me give you an example since you haven't seen the math yet. On a $200,000 loan at 6% interest for 30 years, your monthly payment would be $1,200 a month, of which $1,000 would go towards interest. Why don't you listen to that again? It's a $1,200 payment of which $1,000 goes towards interest. Now, once you get that 15th or 20th year, you start paying more in principal than to interest. But in the early years of a loan, you are paying a ton of interest. Why might a lien holder not want to get paid off in the early years? They want that fat interest. You want to pay us off early in year 22? We care less. We're not making that much money off of you anyway. Okay? But in the early years, in some loans, they do not want to be paid off. Okay? Now, having said that, don't go running home and check your loan to find out if you have a prepayment penalty clause. Because prepayment penalty clauses are actually fairly rare. In North Carolina, if you get a loan on a North Carolina bank, if the loan is less than $150,000, it can't happen. It can't even happen. Okay? Loans are less than $150,000 drawn on North Carolina bank. Listen to this. FHA and VA loans cannot have a prepayment penalty clause. It's not allowed. FHA and VA can't have a prepayment penalty clause. Listen to this. Most loans sold in the secondary market do not have a prepayment penalty clause. We just covered 95% of all loans. So prepayment penalty clauses are fairly rare, but it's not that they're not existent. Okay? So this is really between the lender and the uh, borrower. It's not so much something that agent gets involved in. Prepayment penalty clause. It is what it says. You okay with that? All right, let's get to something important. Do on sale clause. You may want to parenthetically put next to that alienation. As far as I'm concerned, the do on sale clause and the alienation clause mean the same thing. All right, now listen to this definition of a do on sale clause. In the event of a sale, in the event of a sale, S A L E, in the event of a sale, the bank is going to call the whole note due. In other words, if you sell our collateral, we expect to be paid off. It almost sounds like common sense, doesn't it? Yeah. The bank says if you sell our property, we want to be paid off. You want to keep writing and you want to write this down. 